We're going to be talking about preachers who blow bubbles. I tell you what, there's a lot of preachers that blow bubbles. We want to talk about them this afternoon. And I'm going to get the children to help me with this one. And uh, we'll call you up here shortly. As we look in Proverbs chapter 25... We need to pick it up here at verse 21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heat coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Verse 23. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance, a backbiting tongue. Look at verse 25, as cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Verse 26, the righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. And finally, verse 28, he that hath no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks and ask God that you would help us, Father, to understand this word, Lord. We thank you, God, for your goodness. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the dear children, Father. But God, we live in perilous times today. Father, there are folks that are not lifting up the trumpet, giving a certain sound, God. And Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, we know Jeremiah was thrown into the miry pit, God, as the false prophets in his day counteracted your teachings, Lord. Give us ears to hear, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to see the good balance that we have here in the Word of God. I want you to see the harmony in the Word of God. I want you to see how the Bible goes back and forth. It gives you one side, but then it, just in case you don't exaggerate it or go too far, it quickly presents the other side, and it goes back and forth again. And what you have here is two sides. Look at um, the boundaries that are presented. Uh, first of all, in verse 21, it says, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. This is talking about a true need. See, if he's in need, uh, you're not to let him starve. And uh, this means you're to let God be the avenger. And and you're not to take vengeance into your own hand. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. So we have no right to avenge our enemies. uh, And that's God's right. So you see the love here that is uh, revealed by loving your enemies. And God loved his enemies, didn't he? He died on the cross while we were enemies. And... uh, Look at verse 28. He that has no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down without walls. It's very, very important that we don't fill ourselves with wrath and want revenge and take things into our own hands. So you need to control yourself and give place to wrath. And the place uh, where wrath belongs is with God because he is the ultimate judge and he can do a better job than you anyway. Now, hold on a second. That, that, that's a very nice teaching, isn't it? I mean, that's very sweet, isn't it? That's very nice and sweet. It has its place in the Bible. We better not neglect it. We'll be lopsided if if, if we neglect that. But notice verse 23, just in case you get too nice in a way that is not biblical. Verse 23 says, the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. Now, wait a second. There's a place for anger? The Bible says you have a responsibility to be angry at a backbiter. And not only that, it's not just some secret anger that's resting in your bosom. No, you need to reveal your anger. You need to let him see a very angry countenance. Because if somebody starts backbiting and gossiping about somebody and tail-bearing, you're to look at him with an angry eye and give him a look that drives away the backbiting. Do you hear me? You say, how does it drive it away? Simple. 
they get ashamed of themselves and they repent and they realize, boy, that's not accepted around here. Uh, I better get up, you know, get in line. Or they leave. A backbiter, if he doesn't find ears to receive his backbiting, he leaves and finds somewhere else where he can backbite. Backbiting is disloyalty. We know in Proverbs chapter 25, uh, on up a few verses, it tells us in verse 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth. A backbiter is a man, you think he's loyal and you think he's faithful and he pats you on the back and shakes your hand, says, I'm with you, brother. And then he gets behind your back and undermines the work of God or undermines your uh, testimony or whatever it might be, your character. So he's not a very loyal person. It might be rooted in envy. The Bible says, who can stand before envy? You can't do anything right to a person that envies you. John the Baptist came. Uh, and he didn't come eating or drinking. He came out in the wilderness and they said, well, he has a devil. Look at him. He's not eating and drinking with anybody. But then Jesus came eating and drinking uh, in the city and they said, oh, he's a wine bearer and a glutton. And so Jesus used that as an example. You cannot stand before enemy, uh, 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 envy. You can't do anything right. And they're going to find some way to bring you down and uh, be a tailbearer or a backbiter about your character. Now, what we're looking at here is you need the right amount of feminine graces coupled with masculine virtues. And uh, these things are presented in the Bible to where you have the charity and the feminine graces, forgiveness and mercy and that type of thing. But you also have justice and reproof and uh, righteous indignation and righteous anger. And those things are in the Bible as well. And you need to understand that there is a place even in this age for those virtues. And to be angry at sin in the right way at the right time is a virtue. Believe it or not, it's a forgotten virtue, but it is a virtue nonetheless. Okay, it's not true love to be nice to a backbiter. When you hear the railings of a backbiter against one of your brothers and sisters, that's not love. You're not being nice. You're not being Christian when you hear that stuff. But that's what people think in their weakness. They, they lack backbone. They, they, they lack faithfulness and loyalty to Jesus and to their church and to their friends. And so they hear these things. And you've got to understand, friend, I'll tell you very quickly. If you hear the backbiting of a person, don't you think you're going to escape? Because the same person that will backbite somebody else in front of you, you're not special, friend. They'll be all over you, all over your back uh, when, when you know they, they get down the road a little bit. You need to know that. But what we see here is we should not be angry without a cause. There's a time to be angry. The Bible says you should be angry in what? And sin not. Well, anger must not be a sin in some cases. If you're to be angry and sin not. It didn't say don't be angry. It said be angry and sin not. Meaning make sure you don't express your anger in sinful ways. And we see here a man ought to be able to control his spirit. And that's important. Look at Matthew chapter 5 in your AV Bible. The new Bible is butcher this and make a sinner out of Jesus. Because it says, Matthew 5, I say unto you, Jesus said, that whosoever is angry with his brother, but what does he add? Without a call. He didn't just say whoever's angry with his brother. I get angry when people decide just to go serve the devil. I get angry when people undermine God's work. I get angry when people are so immature they can't keep their eyes on the big picture of seeking the kingdom and they get off over into some trifling issue. I get angry at people that go hurt themselves, hurt their family, and drag their children along with it. I tell you what, you want to get me real mad, you get out here and do something stupid and bring your good precious children who are growing in Christ, who are protected, and you get them out here and get them out from the church away from God's people. I tell you what, that makes me very angry. And it ought to make you angry. Well, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So you need to have a cause. Now, there are other qualifications. Proverbs 14. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Notice, soon angry uh, means that you haven't given this thing thought. Uh, you should have a little more patience. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7 says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. You see that? In other words, you've you got to let it build up to the right amount 
before you're allowed. In other words, sometimes you just want to look at somebody, kind of give them that look. You're not looking at them angry yet. You're just saying, you get on the verge of uh, talking about my brother. And I'm just kind of looking at you, see where you're going to go with this thing. And then once they go ahead and manifest it, you're not being soon angry. Now it's time to be angry. Now it's time. Uh, it's done clearly come out that this brother's bringing down a brother or sister. And so it's time now to be angry. So the key is to be controlled by the biblical mind and not by unbridled emotion, right? Now, hold on a second. To make this mean that you should never be angry, to get this idea that Christianity and, and biblical holiness is to never be mad at anything, just smile and talk like Michael Jackson, well, that's not Christianity. Man, if some preacher's up there talking like Michael Jackson and smiling every single sermon, how what, what Bible are you reading, man? That's not my Bible. There's some sermons you ought to be spitting mad. There's some sermons you ought to be just about to come down off this thing. You ought to be upset at some things in this day and age. I don't understand that. Well, yes, I do. There's a buck in it. The love of money is the root of all evil. I understand it perfectly. They have the idea you should never be angry, you should never rebuke sin, you should never confront sin, and it's very foolish because the, Jesus says the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world. It says that the Holy Spirit comes for this very reason to reprove sin and about judgment to come. And Paul, when he was filled with the Spirit, stood before the king and he began to reason with him about righteousness and sobriety and judgment to come, and, and uh, the king trembled. See, there's a place for that. I didn't see Paul standing before that king, smiling like Michael Jackson and saying, oh, you're potential king. Did he say that? God has great things for you, king. Did he say that? No. Do you think Felix would have trembled at that nonsense? He would have said, buddy, I think you're a little funny. You need to take this mad fellow out of here somewhere. We have a place for guys like you. That's not true love. That's secret love. Now, what happened was fundamentalism came out with his fist. And it came out fighting and said, we have enough. You're not going to take over our churches. And you're not going to lie and come and say you're in the name of Christ. And you're not in the name of Christ. So we are going to rebuke you, confront you, expose you. And we're going to manifest the truth. And they came out. Well, their children, some of them, got a little weak. And their children says, no, we're going to have a nicer, and I know it was funded probably by uh, the, these bankers somewhere, but uh, so it's not like people just all of a sudden said, I want to go be nice. It, it, was, it was more a manipulation of the next generation. And uh, they came out and said, we're going to call it new evangelicalism. And we're not going to be mad about anything. We still believe what our fathers believe, but we're not going to be mad about it. We're going to be so nice as we discuss truth with one another. What do you think happened to their generation? Look out here today. It's called the Emerging U2 Church. They say truth. We don't care about truth. There is no truth. We don't care what you believe. Do you see where we're going? I thought the Bible said you ought to contend for the faith. If you've got to contend for something, you've got to stand up. I thought the Bible told a preacher when the last days come, they will not endure sound doctrine. I thought he said reprove, rebuke, but all along suffering and doctrine. And we say that? That's what a preacher is supposed to do. Now we have the new image. The always glad, always smiling, always positive Robert Schuller and Joel Osteen, you know. The preacher is supposed to sound like Michael Jackson now. Who can do a good, Steve's not here, who can do a good Michael Jackson imitation here? Somebody needs to do it. That's the new preacher. And I've said it before, I don't know how somebody sits there and listens to that nonsense. I couldn't listen to Michael Jackson preach to me all the time. And you can't even call it preaching. It's not preaching. It's a surrender to the wicked. I never tell anybody they're wrong. Oh, Larry King takes his spectacles on, about pops his suspenders. He won't even say an atheist is wrong. Oh, that's not my job. It's not my job. I don't say anything's wrong. 
Everything's beautiful. Look at verse 26. I'm going to show you what this is all about. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Do you see that? Y'all sit down over here. I want you to notice. Matthew Henry says, For the righteous to be cowardly, to truckle or bend to the wicked, to be afraid of opposing his wickedness and basely to yield to him. This is a reflection upon religion, a discouragement to good men, and strengthens the hands of sinners in their sins. And so is like a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Verse 25, put it plain. As cold waters to a what soul? Thirsty soul. The Bible says to the hungry, every bitter thing is sweet. You get yourself right as a sinner in need of salvation or as somebody that knows they're guilty. I tell you what, the, the preaching, even though it's hard, bitter preaching, it goes down sweet. If you're thirsty, if you love Jesus and you get right with Jesus and you want to repent of your sin and humble yourself, I'm going to tell you, when you hear that type of preaching, it's like being thirsty out in the desert and coming upon a spring. It's just refreshing to hear the news. That's why these hymns, you talk about a wretch and a worm and, and all of these things, save the sinner, a wretch, a worm like me. And, and, and you can have these, boy, it's like water. It's like spring water. It's good stuff, right? But what if the man of God falls down before the wicked and because he wants the wicked to give him money, he wants to tell the wicked what they want to hear. He falls down before them in compromise. But he calls himself a preacher. You know what that's like? It's not a refreshing spring. It's like going to a place and you're thirsty and all of a sudden there's poison water. Or some cows that done muddied up the stream. That's what it's like. Falling down before the wicked. Shame. This is positive mental attitude. What are the thirsty to do if they wander into a church and all you have is positive mental attitude? They don't want positive mental attitude. They want the truth. Jeremiah 6 says, For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. Does that sound like today? Pastors ought not be into covetousness. And people in the congregation ought not be into covetousness. But if people are into covetousness, they'll pay to have you sanctify their covetousness. Throw a little bit of Bible on it and make me feel good about my covetousness. Do you get it? Why do these preachers do that? Because they're covetous too. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look what happens. Does it really change anything? Does it really change anybody? Does it really help them? No, it heals them, but it's a temporary band-aid upon something, and it doesn't really get to the core of the issue. The core of the issue is sin that needs to be repented of. But they come and heal them slightly. And they tell people they'll have peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. So you've got people out there today in this giant new church, this harlot church that's coming in, this convenient church, this last day's apostate of Laodicean church. I want you to know they're not ashamed of their abominations. And you know why they're not ashamed of their abominations? Because the Bible says there's not a magistrate in the land that will make them ashamed for anything. The Bible says when the people have no magistrate in the land that will stand up and make them ashamed, point out the Word of God, uh, 
lift up their voice like a trumpet, what happens is the people begin to dwell carelessly and loosely. So if the preachers of America leave their post and begin to talk like Michael Jackson and and begin to preach like Robert Shuler, you know what's going to happen in America? Nobody will be ashamed for anything. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. That's the rapture of the church where some of them are going to be left behind. And it also speaks of the coming kingdom. Or it could just speak of judgment on a nation. See, God could judge America long before the rapture happens. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your soul. What the people of America need is to get saved with old-time religion. They need to repent of their sins. They need to know their sinners. They need to repent of their dead works. They need to believe upon the Lord Jesus and begin living in a holy way. And you know what they'll find? They'll find rest. When they order their homes the way God wants them to order it, they'll find rest and peace. You can't find peace through this Joel Olstein mess. It sure sounds good, but it's not going to bring you true peace. But they said, no, notice their stubbornness. Notice they're like Vashti. Notice, uh, we will not walk therein. That's what they're telling us today. We are not walking like that. If you think you're going to bring that stuff, you keep that Ephesians 5 out of here. You ain't bringing that stuff over here to my house. You keep that modesty stuff. You're not bringing that in our house. You keep that old way. You go live like that if you want to. We're living the new way. But guess what? That new way is going to poison your soul, poison your home, poison your joy, poison your soul. Also, I sent watchmen over you, says God, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. Notice they are clearly blowing the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. No shame, no sin is named. They're rich and in need of nothing. So where are God's watchmen today? Oh, you got a few of them lifting up their voices. Praise God, they're out there. But they're being set aside, see. They're outside the camp. Oh, Jeremiah was in the pit. That's what happens to God's watchmen. Notice Isaiah 58, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. But Ezekiel 3 says, son of man, I've made thee a watchman upon the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. But Isaiah 56, 10 says his watchmen are blind. You know, a sad thing, the watchman that's up there on the tower, it is a sad thing if he's blind. They are all ignorant. Isn't that ridiculous? For a watchman to get up there and say, I don't know, is he coming from the east or the west? I don't know. That's a sad thing for a watchman to be ignorant. See, You ought to understand the times like we saw in Esther. We ought to be men that understand what's going on here. We ought not call something that is a hideous curse from Antichrist a revival. You see that? We ought to understand. You ought not be an ignorant watchman. They are all dumb dogs that cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. A dumb dog. That's a mute dog. A dog, though somebody's coming, it doesn't bark. What good is it? Have somebody come in your yard, and here's your old hound dog just sitting up there, just sound asleep. You walk right up on him. That's ridiculous, isn't it? If the devil's coming in, taking over people, destroying women, destroying the children, preachers ought not be dumb dogs. What are you doing, preacher? What are you doing laying around like a dead hound dog? Isn't that crazy? Man, why don't you stand up and help us? Help us rebuke this stuff. Jeremiah 23, they say still unto them that despise me. The Lord hath said, you shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. 
But if they had stood my counsel and had caused my people to hear my word. You see that? Jesus told his disciples, make the men sit down and give them bread. See, a preacher ought to stand up and preach and say, whether you like it or not, man, I'm going to tell you what's true. I've got a commission from God. I've been called not to entertain, but to tell you the truth, and you need to hear the truth. Make them, cause them to hear my word. Not the words of some psychologist somewhere. Not the words of Think and Grow Rich or Napoleon Hill or some man that said ascended masters came into his house and he saw a whole bunch of spirit guides and they gave him the positive thinking manual. You think I want a bunch of that trash? Twelve-step trash who also says ascended spirits came and by automatic writing he wrote out the twelve steps. You think I want that mess? He said, make them hear my word, not doctrines of devils. And positive thinking is a doctrine of devils. All it is is witchcraft. Getting rid of the broomstick and the black cat, but it's still witchcraft. If they had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doing. Do you see what God's words do? God's words, when they preach, they, uh, when they are preached, they turn people from their evil way. That's it. If a preacher is doing God's job, then the people are turning from their evil ways or they're leaving. There's no in between. See? They try to take it over and they, they try to change it. They try to soften down the preacher. They try to uh, uh, get rid of the standards. But if the preacher's stubborn and he makes his face harder than their face, they leave. But if he preaches, whoever stays will turn from their wicked ways. They don't smoke pot anymore. They don't watch wicked things that they used to watch. They don't do these things anymore. And if they do it, they have trouble when they come here. They feel very convicted. They, they, they feel um, horrible. And you ought to feel horrible and ashamed. If you're messing around out there with stuff you shouldn't be, you ought to feel really bad. And I'm going to make you feel bad every time you come here. Second Peter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. We're living in the days... And many shall follow their pernicious, that means destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoke, evil spoken of. What are they going to do? These false teachers are going to say fundamentalism is Phariseeism. Trying to be holy, you don't want to go back and live like you're in the 1700s, do you? We need to live in the 21st century. And so they, they speak evil of holiness. The Bible says they'll be despisers of those that are good. Do you hear me? For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. You know what I see when I see that? I see a bubble. That's why the title of my sermon is Preachers Who Blow Bubbles. The Bible said in the last days there's going to be a flock of preachers that are going to speak swelling words. They're going to blow a big bubble and it's going to pop just like a bubble. It's about as worthless to you as a bubble. Is it going to change your life? No. Is it going to cause you to repent of sin? No. Is it going to make you shame, uh, ashamed about what you watch and what you put on? No at all. Is it going to make you ashamed about what you do with your life? Not at all. It's just a vain bubble. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. There were some people that were separated that wanted to get right, but then they found one of these positive thinking preachers and they started getting bubbles blown on them all the time. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. It's not going to help you get victory over your sin. You know what helps get victory over your sin? When you get ashamed of your sin. That's it. When you said, this is stinking. This is vile. I feel horrible. This just stinks in my soul. This is disgusting. That's what that prodigal did. He got up out of his pig pen, friend. That's what you have to believe. And if you don't preach against sin and you don't see how abominable it is, if you sugarcoat it, nobody will leave it. Okay, children, I want to do something right now. I want every child to come up here and line up here. Come on.
Here you go. Here's bubbles for you. Well, thank you, buddy. Here you go. Come on. Y'all help me with these bubbles. I'll tell you what, we're going to give honor to these preachers right now. That's what we're going to... I'm going to honor the preachers, some of these preachers in America. Come on, little ones. Grab your bubbles. Here you go. We're going to celebrate. This is great, isn't it? I tell you what, blowing bubbles while the preacher's preaching. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Here you go. Y'all know how to blow bubbles? I know. A lot of preachers do, too. Here you go. I tell you what, a lot of preachers... Oh, let's not get picky now. Can I trade it in for a blue one? That's what they do, too. Uh, Receive to themselves teachers having itching ears. They say, well, I don't like that church. I need a new bubble blower. Here you go. Y'all quit with the colors now. Come on. Give a preacher a little bit of slack here. All right. Here you go. Here you go. Bubbles, 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 bubbles. There we go. Here you go. All right. Now, what y'all are going to do is y'all are going to do exactly what everybody's doing today, just about. Anybody else not have bubbles? Everybody, y'all want some? Some of you adults want to blow bubbles? Here you go, brother. Blow some bubbles. All right, anybody not get bubbles? We're going to celebrate Joe Olstein right now. This is my tribute to Joe Olstein and Robert Shuler. Here, Abida. Hand that to Abida. Here you go. I didn't know we had so many children. What about those over there? They get Did they get some bubbles? Oh, well, hold on. Y'all not ready yet? Hold on. All right, here we go. Hey, these aren't just ordinary bubbles. Now, listen up. This is imperial super miracle bubbles. Man, that fits these preachers, doesn't it? Because they're not just an ordinary humble preacher. They are super miracle preachers blowing their miracle bubbles. Bubbles. Now, what I want y'all to do is get up here and just blow big bubbles. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a quote from Joel Osteen, and I want to see the biggest bubbles blown that you've ever blown. Hold on, hold on a second. Don't blow them yet. Don't blow them yet. Here we go. Let me give you the quote from Joel Osteen. Listen, don't dangle people over the fires of hell. Listen, that doesn't draw people to God. They know what kind of life they live. What you've got to do is talk about the goodness of God. Okay, y'all blow a big bubble. Big ones. Come on. Look at it. Bubbles. Let's go. Blow them. Blow them. Bubble. Look at that bubble. Wow. Okay, here's another one. I think for years there's been a lot of hellfire and damnation. You go to church to figure out what you're doing wrong and you leave feeling bad. You're not going to make it. Blow the bubbles. Blow them. Blow. Big one. Wasn't that a big bubble? Blow them. Here's another one. Okay, get ready. Get ready. The Bible indicates that for three days, Jesus went into the very depths of hell, right into the enemy's own territory. And he did battle with Satan face to face. Is that true? No, that's a big bubble of, bl of vanity. Blow the bubble. Come on, let's see it. Blow them faster. Faster. There's one for Schuler. There's one for Kenneth Copeland. There's one for Joe Olstein. Look at that one. Here's Olstein's bubble. Look at that. Look at that. Come on, blow them. Here's one. We believe in new beginnings. We believe in you. Bubbles. Come on, blow them. Bubbles get in your eyes and hurt you, don't they, sweetie? Be careful. That's the problem with bubbles, isn't it? You just blew one right on me, buddy. Now stop. Your words have creative power. Joe Osteen, blow some bubbles. Your words have creative power. Isn't that nice? Doesn't that make you feel good? Boy, you're going to get home and smash your TV, aren't you? Your words have creative power. Blow them bubbles, y'all. Come on. What about this one? Okay, spit blowing on me, but watch this one. The Israelites' lack of faith and their lack of self-esteem robbed them of their fruitful future that God had in store for them. Is that the problem with the Israelites? They lack self-esteem? Was that the problem? Is that a big bubble? That's what it is. It's a great big swelling bubble. Blow one. Come on. Bubbles. There's one. Blow some. Come on, Nina. Blow. Bubbles. Self-esteem bubbles. 
Okay, here's one. Blow some bubbles for visualization. Watch this. Now quit now. There's power in what you visualize. Take a few moments each day to visualize things you want in your life so God can bring them to pass. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? That's a bubble. Blow it. Girls, that's what this preaching is. Boys, it's just a bunch of bubbles. Here's one. You must conceive it in your heart and mind before you can receive it. See, whatever you believe and conceive in your heart, you can make, you can turn it into reality. Is that true? That's a witchcraft bubble. Y'all give us some bubbles for the witchcraft bubble and then knock them out. See, watch this. Knock them. Witchcraft bubbles. This is what witchcraft does for your life. Look at me. Shh, hush. This is what witchcraft does for your life. You see this? It does nothing for your life. It curses you. It's just a bubble. That's what that preaching is. Do you see that? It's not going to help you break sinful habits. Okay, here's one. You must have creative power. When you go around saying, I have favor with people, the doors will be opening. When you make those declarations of faith, you are charging the atmosphere. And your own words can help to bring it to pass. More bubbles. Let's go. Don't blow on people. Don't eat them. Don't eat these bubbles. You can cancel out God's plan by speaking negative words. God works by laws. Is that true? Hey, what about this one now? Start calling it divine help. Start calling it abundance. You can prophesy your future. So if you're sick, just say, like Mary Baker Eddy and Christian Science, just say you're well. And if you'll just say you're well, you will be. You know what that is? It sure sounds good, doesn't it? It's witchcraft, but it sure sounds good to the flesh, doesn't it? Boy, that's a lot better than preaching about women's garments, ain't it? Boy, old Joel, well, we like that. Preach some more like that. Look at all those little bubbles. Look at them. Michael Jackson bubbles. Michael Jackson bubbles. Okay, what about this one? Well, you say, Joel, that sounds like wishful thinking. No, that's using your words to create what you need. Bubbles. You know, it's wonderful to know that faith is a power and a force. Did you know your faith was a force? It's a scientific force. You may have sickness in your body, but you need to call it help. You may be in debt, but you need to boldly say, I am the head and not the tail. That'll fix it. Just get in the mirror every day and says, I am not the tail. I am not the tail. I am not the tail. This is bubbles, people. I want you to see it's bubbles. It's worthless for your life. It does nothing for your life. It's a bunch of bubbles. Fear is a force, just like faith is a force. So keep away from fear. Fear is negative. Satan says, listen, Jesus, you're on my turf now. You don't have a chance down here. You're surrounded by demons. We're going to tear you apart. And Jesus just smiles and says, go ahead, Satan, make my day. I can't imagine him saying, go ahead, Satan, make my day. But you know what they're saying? They have the old Roman Catholic superstition that Satan's down in hell with a bunch of devils and that that's his palace. You think Satan wants to go to hell? He wants to stay as far away as he can from hell. And Jesus didn't wrestle with the devil down in hell. Bunch of bubbles. He grabbed Satan by the nap of his neck and he began to slowly drag him down through the corridors of hell. And thousands of people scream and holler, Yay! You know what they heard? A bunch of bubbles. That's what they heard. A bunch of bubbles. Now, here's the big... Okay, children, stop blowing for a second. Stop blowing. Now, I want you all to listen up. Listen clearly. This is a big bubble. Because he's about to say, be still. He's about to say, 
Jesus paid the price so you can be free from low self-esteem. Did you know Jesus came all the way down here to earth so you wouldn't have to have low self-esteem? Blow a big bubble, kids. Blow a big one. Look at this. Look at all these kids. Blow a big one. More of them. Come on. Look at Tabitha. That's a big one, Kayla. That's an Osteen bubble right there. That's an Osteen bubble. Caleb, that's a Robert Schuler bubble. Look at that one. Who is that? That's a James Dobson bubble. I'm about to give you a bubble. Okay, here's some sermon titles. Enlarge your vision. Holding on to your dreams. Financial prosperity. Don't put them on anybody. How valuable you are in God's eyes. The next Sunday, overcoming the greatest hindrance to healing. Next Sunday, developing miracle working faith. Next Sunday, faith to change your world. Next Sunday, believe God for the greater works. Next Sunday, do all you can to make your dreams come true. Sounds like they're selling you a Hawaii vacation, doesn't it? Next Sunday, living a life of excellence. Next Sunday, developing your potential. It's all bubbles. Every bit of it. What's so sad about it is people think it's Christianity. Jesus says, I want you hot or cold. I don't want this lukewarm stuff because it confuses people. He says, I'm going to vomit that out of my mouth. Pick a side. That's what Jesus says in the last day. Pick a side. Okay, I'll close with one verse. Romans 16. They that are such... Listen, quiet. Preacher's preaching. They that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. If you've been deceived by Robert Schuller, Joe Olstein, or any of these fair speech bubble preachers, the Bible says it's because you're simple-minded. You don't have to be simple-minded. If you get in the Word of God and study it, it'll give you wisdom. And you'll be able to discern and you won't fall for preachers like that. But you can follow them if you want to, but I'm going to tell you, it will do nothing for your life. And you will not find freedom over sin. You will not find victory over sin. Because you have to be ashamed of your sin if you ever want to leave it off. And these folks do not preach on sin. They don't preach about sin. And it's a horrible, horrible thing. Let's give all our bubble-blowing kids a hand. Give them a hand here. Thank you, children. Thank you, children. Let's pray for the bubble preachers. Y'all bow your head. Bow your head. Dear Lord, we pray for these preachers in these last days, God. Oh, Father, they might have convinced themselves that they're doing what's right, God. Oh, Father, I know the Bible says the goodness of the Lord leadeth us to, a, to repentance, God, and I'm sure they could grab texts like that and probably justify what they're doing, God. But, Lord, I think deep down they know, God, that they're sellouts. They're compromisers. They're these men that the Bible prophesied would come who promised them liberty, God. Oh, Father, let them be. Let them please, God. Be convicted. And let them give it up, God. Let them get before their people. And one Sunday, Lord, I pray they'll get before those coliseums and just lay it on them, God, by the power of the Holy Ghost and repent of all that they've been doing, God. I know they'll leave, everybody will leave and run out, God, but a lot of people might be changed, Father. I pray for repentance and I pray these bubble preachers, God, will get out of the middle, Father. I pray, Father, that they will not be in the middle, that they'll pick a side, Lord, in the name of Jesus, amen.